I'm Dean Newland, and welcome to the Business of Intuition, where I coach, facilitate, train, and speak on the hard science and meaningful experience of intuitive leadership in business, so you can make better decisions, forge real connections, and creatively solve problems to amplify your impact and simplify your life. Welcome to the Business of Intuition. How can we foster growth without losing our top talent to the allure of the gig economy? And is it possible to envision a future where employees remain with a company for life? To create a more sticky environment for today's free agent employees, companies must focus on three key strategies. Number one, aligning individual aspirations with the organizational vision. Number two, crafting a culture of continuous personal and professional development. And number three, redefining roles to resonate with employees, evolving interests and skills. These approaches not only will enhance engagement and loyalty, but also position companies to thrive in an era where adaptability and alignment with personal goals are paramount. Well, my next guest on the business of intuition, Claire Chandler and I had just wonderful conversation, and we got right into these wonderful topics. Claire is president and founder of Talent Boost, which specializes in aligning HR and business leaders so they can deliver strategic outcomes, both today and in the future. She taps into over 25 years of experience in people leadership, human resources, and business ownership to help leadership teams work together more effectively in less time with less cultural resistance so they can accelerate their business growth. Claire holds a certificate in strategic HR leadership from Cornell's School of Industrial and Labor Relations, a master's degree from the New Jersey Institute of Technology, and a bachelor degree from Fairfield University. She has appeared as a guest on over 100 podcasts and is the author of several books on leadership and business strategy. Claire Chandler on the Business of Intuition. So Claire, great to have you on the show. Thank you very much for your time. I want to start off with an acknowledgement that we are talking in February of 2024. There is an interesting year coming up. <laughs> that we're in right now. A tremendous amount of energy. There is a kind of a bullishness around the market with respect to how businesses are feeling at the same time. A little caution, you know, election year coming up. What the heck is going to happen with interest rates? Are, are they going to, you know, actually come down the way we think they are, or are they going to sort of stay stagnant for a while? So while there's a tremendous amount of energy, there's also a lot of caution, it seems like. And a lot of companies that I think we have been connecting with, you as well, I'm sure, are talking about this idea like, you know, maybe this is the time that we can start seeing some real growth. Maybe this is not the COVID years where we had to just keep the lights on, but maybe we can invest in people, invest in our companies. We can actually see some top line growth. And, and so let's, let's do that. Maybe we should do that now. You have a point of view that maybe growing could also be a possibility where we could lose some good people. And when I saw that on your website, I thought, hmm, I think she's onto something, but I don't know what you're onto. So could you explain why is growth sometimes a situation where people are concerned about losing their top talent? How are those two connected? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, thank you so much for having me. It is great to share your stage for, for this short period of time. You picked quite a jumping off point. It is February of 2024. As we're talking, we're about to enter or, or get deeper into what is promising to be quite the tumultuous year, right? And I suspect as entrepreneurs, some might argue we are better prepared for the frenetic energy and the chaos that is that is ensuing all around us. But some might argue, well, we, we already have shiny object syndrome, we're control freaks, and to enter a year of unmitigated chaos might not be great for entrepreneurs. Who knows? That remains to be seen. I, I, I think the last four years have proven to us that we don't actually know what's going to happen in our future. The best we can do is prepare and pivot, right? But that leads to companies that are trying to grow. I think now that we are a couple of years removed 
from the height, or should I say the depth of the global pandemic. Most companies that not only survived that globally shared experience, but have come out the other side with a fresh perspective are now reinvigorated around, how are we going to grow? Because it is true that businesses have two choices. They either grow or they die, right? There is no longer, we no longer live in a time where companies can just tread water, maintain status quo, think that their talent that they have is going to stay for a variety of reasons. But when I narrow it into the topic around talent, I think one of the realities that we are facing, especially since the pandemic, is that the tenure of your average employee, whether they are an individual contributor or boots on the ground or an executive leader, seldom do employees, and it's not not that every employee is like this, but more and more employees and leaders are only staying within an organization for a fixed period of time. What is that fixed period of time? Is there an average? Is there like a mean? Well, so for, yeah. So for executive leaders, it's somewhere between four and five years. For people, I don't want to say lower down the hierarchy, but there's really no other way that I can think of to describe it. They do tend to stay a little bit longer, but it's a candidate's market right now. You know, most employees that I talk to, if they are not actively looking for a job, which we've known for years, you know, all the statistics about it. I think it's over a third of employees start to look for their next job on day one of their their new job, right? They're constantly testing the waters. I think even more so now, because so many organizations had to pivot, so many organizations did not survive or did not evolve sufficiently through the pandemic. And the ones that did, the ones that embraced the hybrid workforce, the flexible working, the virtual uh, workspaces, all of those sorts of things, are in a little bit of a better position to attract talent. What's interesting is before the global pandemic, right before the pandemic, right before the lockdown, I was working with clients and most of them were working on strategic plans. And when I tell you they were looking at a 20 year horizon for their strategic plan, that seems ridiculous now, right? To think that we could possibly build a strategic plan that looks 20 years out and it's remotely going to be in line after year three is ludicrous in hindsight. And so now that we're out of the the height or the depth of the, of the global pandemic, most organizations are sort of putting, putting that view out of their minds and they're saying, realistically, we can look ahead maybe five years, but really it's three. Let's really nail down what our three to five year outcomes need to be and build plans and build roadmaps and build teams around that. But what's interesting is now that we are through the worst of the pandemic, and organizations are shifting back to not just surviving, but thriving and growing and expanding. They're also realizing that growth is going to come more effectively through mergers and acquisitions, through expansion into new geographies or business lines. Most organizations, not all, but most organizations are understanding that they will not impact the market, let alone their culture, in the right direction, one new hire at a time. That the way to grow in a sustainable way is to do that by joining forces, by combining, by expanding, by you know diversifying, and all of that. But you combine that sort of growth, that sort of you know we're not going to stay the way we always have been because we have to evolve or die, with the fact that the tenure of the average employee, let alone the executive leader, has dwindled. That makes for a lot of inconsistency. That makes for a lot of uncertainty, and employees are are finding that they have options. Even if they love the company that they're in, they have options to go and try something else. Because if nothing else, this globally shared experience of the pandemic taught us that life is too short. And they are understanding that, I think, now more than ever. So is your argument then that the reason why growth can sometimes cause employees to want to leave is because of the change involved the inconsistency of things that come from growth, either through a merger. Now we have another culture being merged into ours and we have to recreate ourselves or because simply growth itself creates change and chaos and all the other things that go with it. And ergo, maybe I don't want to sign up for that and I'd like to go someplace else. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah. I, I mean, it's 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 those things. It is the innate human resistance to change that hasn't, right. hasn't changed, right? Right. It is our natural instinct to resist change because the way we survive is by sticking with the devil that we know. Right. But I think also organizationally, companies have learned that 
they do need to adapt. It's not just about growth for the sake of growth. They need to adapt. They need to be to, to be more agile. They need to be able to pivot and evolve. But the missing step that I have found that is serving as a bit of a catalyst or an inspiration for employees to explore other options is that as they grow, as they pivot, as they change as an organization, they're not necessarily and intentionally bringing their employees along in the journey. And what I mean by that is it's not about, well, we want to make sure we retain talent. Employees aren't looking, like I said, the tenure is shrinking, right? So employees are not necessarily just looking for a company to hang out with, regardless of how you might pivot or grow or change or combine with another organization. Employees are now looking for a company they can believe in and a working environment where they feel that they belong. So, and, so, and so that ground has shifted. So let me ask you this is uh, before you get down to the next yeah. step here. This is an important thought. Yeah, I think you were saying that people want to believe in the company, that they want to feel a part of it, um, which is if the, the lack thereof is what might cause people to consider moving on to places elsewhere. Get it. Are you suggesting that companies, when they're pivoting and growing, would more involve their employees in what that looks like? Because normally what happens with major changes, it's at the top down versus the bottom up. Oh, guess what? We're changing. We're going to merge. Oh, guess what? We're going to bring on these smaller partner companies. Oh, guess what? We're going to try to improve our top line revenues by 20%. So we're going to double down on sales and marketing and new product development, whatever. That's often a top down sort of discussion that then the lower level quote unquote employees have to figure out how the heck to do that. Are you proposing that they might need to engage those people who are going to be actually making this happen, be a part of those design conversations up front? They don't necessarily need to be invited or involved in the design conversations, but they do need to be brought into the loop earlier on. Now, a lot I of people in your audience, yeah, well, here's yeah. the thing, because a lot of people in your audience are going to hear that and say, yeah, but you got to understand with a merger situation, there's a blackout period and we can't right. talk about what we're doing, NDAs right? NDAs are written, all that. Yeah. hundred percent. But here's the thing. What you can share with them is that journey of what that future looks like. That, you know, while we may not be able to talk about certain pieces of our strategy right now, let's bring you into our vision for the future, right? Simon Sinek, sure you've heard of. Big yeah. thought leader on the space of start with why, right? Right, right. The concept that he has built an entire enterprise around is actually quite simple. Right. Which is, you know, every every organization knows what they do. Most organizations, if they've been around a while, have figured out how to do it. Yeah. But it's the ones that stand apart are the ones that truly understand and connect to why it is that they're in business in the first place. And so I think that is the, it's not the missing link. Organizations eventually get around to, you know, their communication rollout strategy where they're going to tell the employees why we just merged with that company or why we expanded into this next, you know, department, division, geography, business line, et cetera. But it's really about getting out in front of that and painting that future horizon that people can feel connected to on a personal level. All right. So let me uh, buttress what you just said. You said earlier that companies are no longer thinking strategic plans, you know, 10, 15, 20 years out. They're really shrinking it down to the next two years, three years, maybe five years if they're lucky. And I would also think though, and I do believe in this very wholeheartedly, that there is a difference between a strategy and a vision. And the vision is more in line with what Senek is talking about in terms of why. And a vision could in fact be many years out, could even be 40 years out, because these are visions that are not sustained. Not, no. These are visions that cannot be accomplished, maybe even in one life. And when you start to say, okay, we are going to pivot, we're going to add some new business lines, who knows, maybe one day we might be in, in line of being acquired or acquiring another organization. But what does it change is our vision. And I remember, I can't speak the, the name of the company, but we were going through the same thing, you know? was working with the CEO, I said, no matter what, whether you decide to merge or partner up or not, overlay all of this conversation with your longer term vision. Because people right. will go, okay, we can go through the tumultuousness of five years of integration, if that's what we have to do. And all the change and the chaos that comes together with bringing two companies together. 
But if we know what we are doing it for, the cynic wife, we understand the 10-year, 50-year, 100-year vision for this. What does this mean? Yep. I can get my arms around that. And I don't know whether organizations and companies and teams and people really get the whole benefit of thinking long term. Again, I don't mean strategy. I mean yep. vision. I would, yep. if, you, if you've been to Europe, anybody who's been to Europe, anyone who's been abroad, and walk around these museums and walk around these ancient cities that are hundreds of years old, sometimes thousands of years old, or organizations who've been around for five or 600 years, you kind of go, oh my gosh, in the United States, our mindset is so small in terms of the time frame by which we plan and think and engage people. And I, lately, I've been somehow attracting a few companies that are family owned that are 100 years old or more. And interesting types of cultures that have that longevity, that, that long vision. So anyway, does this align with your thinking? Yeah, w wonderful. And, and the family-owned businesses are a, are a very interesting example of what you just sort of went through, right? Because if you, if you look at the trajectory of any family-owned business, you know, that first generation that founded the business had a very clear idea of what it was they were trying to build. What was the legacy? What was the impact for their family, for the people that they brought into their employee? And usually then the second generation comes in and they and they change a lot of things. Right. Yeah. And then you have the third generation and they start to, you know, maybe stabilize and they start to scale. But what does not change to your point is the overall vision of what this family was all about, what this right. family was trying to build, because their name's on the door. Right. Right. So to speak. So it's a it's a perfect illustration of the difference between the, the strategy which may evolve, it may change, it may pivot, it may flat out be completely different. Again, you know, we're talking about organizations as an example that prior to COVID were looking at, you know, impacting and increasing their competitive advantage one higher at a time that are now on the other side of the pandemic and saying, we've got to make up ground. The best way to do that is through mergers and acquisitions. But what didn't change is that longer term vision. So yeah. yes, your point about the difference between a vision and a strategy, it, we're completely aligned. And I think, to your point, when leaders at the top of an organization, because that is where it starts, they have to not only set the vision, they have to be committed to it wholeheartedly, and they also have to design the strategy. But when they are more intentional, more proactive about bringing employees into the loop in terms of that longer term vision earlier on in helping people connect their own personal motivations, their own internal why with the organizational why. Right. See much higher tolerance for those course corrections along the way. Right. Right. I, you know, some of the companies that I deal with when you get to the layer below executive management, let alone when you get to the boots on the ground, their common complaint is we keep changing direction. We yes. keep changing what we say we're doing. Right. And because those executive leaders don't always do a thorough enough job of bringing people into or ensuring a deeper connection with the longer term plan, the longer term vision, the longer term why, they're misinterpreting course corrections that are strategic along the way. And what they're seeing is these people don't know how to make a decision. Right. The reality may be different. Now, for some organizations, they're led by teams that don't know how to make a decision. But in a lot of cases, it's because they're pivoting due to market forces, competitive circumstances, and other things that the rest of the organization is not privy to. Why is it that we are not good at creating longer-term visions? And why do we sort of get bored with that process and get right into operations? One, because I think the vision is far less tangible in most cases. And two, when you combine that with the diminished tenure of an executive leader. So again, if you just look at the C-suite, right? Their average tenure now is four or five years-ish. Some are longer, granted, but they are under such tremendous pressure from their board, the investors, stakeholders around them to start to make tangible inroads on their strategy within the first 18 months, if they even have that long of a honeymoon period. Right. Um, it is harder for them because of that intense short-term pressure to intentionally kind of pull back and say, wait a minute, we've got to, we've got to design for the longer term vision because they're designing a vision or they're coming in to help sustain momentum toward a vision that by definition and by nature is going to outlast their tenure. Right. Right. So they're, it's not that they're conflicting 
But when they are incentivized to meet tangible outcomes within the first 18 months to three years, that's what they're going to focus on the, the most. And if there's a if there is a mismatch between the outcomes that they have been brought in to produce, yeah. And then at 20, 30, 50, 100 year vision, but well, where are they going to focus? They're going to focus on what's incentivized. They're going to focus on what they are rewarded or penalized against. Right. I think I had this vision of a of walking in a forest that had been around for hundreds and thousands of years. You know, and the the forest just sort of takes over, you know, your own awareness of everything. It starts to affect you, right? In a way, that's the analogy of a long-term vision. You know, if it, if you have enough experience, tangible experience of what it feels like to be bathed in a long-term vision versus just a platitude on the break room wall that says, this is our vision, you know, which means very little after a while. You stop even seeing it. It's like the painting in your house that you bought at the flea market. You no longer see it because it's been sitting there for the last 20 years, right? Vision statements are the same way. We got to keep infusing energy into them and making people feel bathed in what that longer term vision is, much like walking into a forest. But then conversely, my cell phone all of a sudden starts to bleep out some sort of a text that's coming like, oh, immediate gratification, short term. I can automatically lose the long term vision of the forest and get into the short term, tangible, endorphin creating, tactical, strategic, immediate situation that my cell phone represents. And I think that that's a, that's a challenge, I think. I think that's what my experience with, with working with companies is we love the idea of vision statements, but now that we're done with that, let's get to the real work. Yeah, well, and, it, and it's why a vision statement, and I hate tagging statement onto the end of it because you're exactly right. They become posterized, yeah. they get put on your website, and they're really public facing and they've got all this flowery corporate language that doesn't actually resonate with anyone who is charged with fulfilling it or, or moving you closer to it. Right. But it is why a vision on its own is not necessarily achievable. If you don't have a strategy that helps move the needle at least closer to that, right, year over year or, or you know, decade over decade. But why you have to look at it in combination with your mission and your set of values. Yeah. Because all of that weaves the fabric of your culture. Right. Your vision is still I, I, I heard it said once and I cannot remember what the what the author's name was, but it always stuck with me that a vision pulls you, a mission pushes you mm. and your values keep you from veering off the road. I love that. Yeah. And, and so I think to your point, you know, the vision does have to be lofty. It has to be aspirational. It has to be about more than just me or my coworkers or the current leadership team. It has to be about something greater, especially in this day and age, because as I said, employees are looking for a reason to believe and a place to belong and all of those and all of those things. But then for the day to day, what are they charged with? How are they challenged to produce? And that, yeah, that's the strategy and that's the financial indicators and that's the balance scorecard. That's all that stuff. But it's also the mission. How are we going to do that? Right. And then the values come into play. Because I think if the if the vision, you know, visions can evolve over time, but they really shouldn't materially change if you, know, you, you really are dialed into your why, why you're in business to begin with. But the values are what are going to orient people to what is acceptable, what is rewarded, what is tolerated, and what is going to be the, the hallmarks of our organizational culture. Right, so thanks. those two have to work in combination. I get it. Wonderfully uh, laid out there. Two questions, somewhat related. One, how do we engage people in the intangibility of a longer term vision, which to your point might be part of the stickiness that allows a person to stay at a company through times of pivoting and change and growth? So that's one side of the equation. Like, what does a company do to create that ability for a person to go, oh, I'm walking through the forest of the vision and I really get the tangible, I get the benefit, I can feel it, right? That's one side of it. The other side of it, and I do think that there's a lot of emphasis that companies and podcasts and book plates on the responsibility of the company to create these ecosystems by which these people called employees come in and engage with us. And if the ecosystem is well developed, they will then decide to participate or they won't. They will go somewhere else. Free agent nation, right? Uh, to your point. Quoting, what was it? Um, Dan Pink, I think, who wrote that book many years ago. On the other hand, though, 
We don't spend a lot of time talking about the employee relationship to the company in terms of their responsibilities for that side of the equation. We spend a lot of time talking about the equation side or the side of the equation that has to do with the company creating the environment. But what about the side of the equation that is me and my personal responsibility to make this work for me and the, and the organization I work for? So two separate co- uh, yeah. th- th- points or questions, but I'd love to get your thoughts on it. So to me, the, the, the two kind of buzzwords, that, not buzzwords, but keywords that come up for me in answering that two-sided question is connection and accountability. And I'm going to say that out loud so I remember to come back to the, to the right. second part. I think in, in, in a partial answer to your first question, organizations have to do a better job of helping employees make that connection between what personally motivates them what they are personally sort of driven by, you know, not not just in terms of their internal rewards, but what comes naturally to them by way of strengths and how that connects to moving the needle in tangible ways, you know, and fulfillment of the mission, demonstration of the values and fulfillment of the, and, and, and moving closer to the, to the vision. We also have to be realistic. As I said, most employees, not all employees, but most employees don't stick around with, a, with, a, with an organization for their entire career anymore. And so we also have to be realistic. It is not about squeezing every ounce of, of creative juice we possibly can get out of them for the short time that they are there, but really give them an environment, an experience where they can be at their best, where they can contribute their best ideas, and that they can help in working together across teams solve bigger problems for the organization. What's interesting is before the before the lockdown of COVID, um, one of the clients that I was working with on their 20-year strategic plan, they were starting to envision how they were going to evolve toward this kind of, you know, we, we've, we've seen an, a major shift toward a knowledge economy, right? We're not really an industrial economy anymore. We're an intellectual economy, a knowledge economy, call it what you want. But part of the way that they envision the future was shifting the composition of the workforce away from just full-time, part-time contractor to this notion of the gig economy. Now, we've seen with the rise of Upwork and Fiverr and all of these other sort of freelancing websites that if you have a very short-term project, you can go out and basically acquire talent, pay for their skills, and then let them go when the project is over. Well, organizations are now starting to look at that and saying, how do we, how do we embrace employees through that same lens to say, how do we appreciate, how do, first of all, how do, we, how do we understand, how do we measure what their skill sets are, what their talents are, what their motivations are, and then how do we put them in a path where they can play to those strengths as much as possible so that they're more fulfilled, more productive, more engaged, happier, maybe stay longer. And while they're doing that, they're more willing to work across the aisle with the rest of their teammates and colleagues to solve those bigger problems which will then put you on the right road toward fulfilling your growth strategy, right? So there's this sort of connection piece. But the second part, that second question comes to accountability because you're right. It is not just up to the organization, the executive leadership, or even the direct people managers to give the employees all the answers. It is incumbent upon them to ask better questions. It is incumbent upon them to create an environment where employees do feel like you know, I'm kind of tired of the platitude of we want you to bring your best, you know, your your fullest, most authentic self to work. And the first thing that happens is when they start to demonstrate their unique personality, they're sort of slapped down for that. And it's like, well, wait, wait, that's not really what we meant. When we said bring your authentic self, we meant still like within this lane, right? So organizations do need to create an environment where they help employees become more self-aware of what they bring to the table by way of skill sets, by way of personal motivations, et cetera. But then also we live in a time where technology can aid us. We can give employees platforms where they can drive their own development, right? Where they can learn at a higher level, where they can hone their skills into job-specific roles and duties and accomplishments that move the needle collect. And so I completely agree with you. It is not just on the organization. There is a, even though we don't call them contracts, there is a two-way agreement here between the employer and the employee. And the employee needs exactly. to understand that while an organization gives you an environment where you can grow and we're going to yeah. pay you a fair wage and we're going to give you good benefits, et cetera, yeah. we're also going to expect that you bring it, that you bring your A game. And we're going to try to find pathways for you to do that in, in increasingly accountable ways. 
Yeah, and there may have been a, a, a pendulum that's moving in a direction towards we have to coddle the, the employee more so than what's probably best for them, and but for the organization. Think about parenting skills. You know, we need to say there is a time by which this behavior isn't going to work and we have to, you know, do something to address it or move you out or what have you. And I do think that we've moved a bit in that direction and we have to continue to look at the other side of the equation, which is what is the employee's responsibility moving forward here. And then, then of course, that gets into things that we don't want to have, which is about accountability conversations, which is a cousin to conflict and conflict hurts. And therefore, we're concerned about you know saying something that's going to upset somebody. They might leave and we don't have enough people as it is because the talent market is so short. And we got five people that we still have open recs for. And like, well, we don't want to lose this person because... You know, we got to have somebody, even though they don't work well, let's don't lose it, right? So, so so, you just articulated the inner dialogue that happens between the ears of just about every people manager. I'm ever sure. Ever, right? Because you're right. Like, it's it's a lot. And we're asking, you know, people managers to do a lot. It's, it's a tough job. And what I'm finding is, because I'm working with clients right now around that, is, is, is how do we increase the competence and the confidence of people managers because what we're finding is, you know, everybody sort of says, well, people need to get better at conflict resolution. And while that's true, we actually need to resolve the skill gap that's a little bit farther upstream, which is not only are they resisting addressing conflict in their teams, they're actually avoiding earlier conversations. Oh, yeah. You said something before about sort of this accountability of, of saying, like almost drawing a line in the sand and saying, okay, but after today, we won't tolerate that behavior. Yeah, And I think for some people managers, they keep moving that line because they don't want to have to have that conversation. You know, they're convincing them that, themselves, well, we hired adults, they're going to figure it out. They're going to know like the right thing to do. But the first time you avoid addressing somebody who violates the values that you've set or the behavioral norms that you're trying to reinforce or the culture that you're trying to nurture and you say, well, they didn't know, they're new, this is their first strike, you're allowing it to build up. Right. As one of the leaders that I respect highly always said, you get what you tolerate. And it's Bingo. true, right? It's true. Yeah. And I think that what you're saying is upstream of conflict and accountability is clarity of expectations. One hundred And consistency. Consistency. And I just consistent. had this conversation with a group, you know, last week where you've got expectations that are task oriented, you know, the things that I have to do for the job, for my manager. For the company. And then there's, you know, EQ or emotional intelligence or behaviors, which is also, we have expectations around how we, you and I work with each other. I like, you know, transparency. I like email versus texting, you know, all the way, all the way up to the team and the, and the organization. And I think that um, before we really address conflict and accountability, we have to ask ourselves, have we been clear about expectations and consistent? And you've been through this. I mean, everybody's been through this. I was just talking to somebody recently about this. We were unpacking a particular employee about why they were having problems with this person. And I kept dig digging and digging into you know the history of that relationship. And it found out that they did a pretty poor job of onboarding them. They didn't know. They were coming into a new culture. You know. Now, yeah, one could say there is a certain culpability on the side of the employee that they could figure this stuff out. But we haven't done a good enough job of really telling people, this is how it is here. And this is what, what I expect, the team expects, and so forth. I want to go back to something you, you said about these sort of micro projects. You know, you mentioned Upwork and kind of thinking and aligning people to those projects and, and, and so forth. But, and I have just had this thought, you know, we talked about visioning being a long-term thing for a company, but I hypothetically, I, I like the idea, and I want to get your reaction to this, of creating a vision for employees who want to and have the opportunity to reach their highest potential for the rest of their life. That we go against this free agent nation mindset that we've almost sort of said, it is the way it is. I can't expect my senior leaders to last any more than four or five years. I can't expect my people below them to last any more than eight years. So let's just get into the mindset that that's what it is. And we, therefore, we develop systems and processes and behaviors that sort of in unintentionally support that. And then we justify when somebody leaves because, well, you know, they did spend six years here. That's not bad. We should count that as a win. 
Lewis says, wait a minute. What if we have the vision to say, again, it's a big, hairy, audacious BHAG of a goal. But what if we were to say, as an organization, we are going to have a vision that everybody who walks in here wants to and can be fully engaged and meet their highest and best potential for the rest of their life. Now, is it possible all the time? Hell no. But does the mindset start opening up new possibilities for systems and processes and incentives and coaching and blah, 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 and putting people in the right places and setting them up for success because of our accountability and our conflict resolution and setting expectations and being able to put people in new roles and move them around to different places and have them experience this and this and this. I don't know. I just thought of it. What do you think? Yeah. Well, it, it's, it's BHAG for sure. Huge um, BHAG. I get it. But, but what's interesting is rather than having the, the reflex reaction to that, to say that can't be done and look at all the chaos that that would invite, picture the the concept, like visualize what just happened when you just removed the ceiling. You right. just removed the ceiling against which people are inevitably going to bump because they have an average tenure or the average skill set or this or that or the other. Or our organization is not designed to deviate from, so I'm going to go on a soapbox for a minute, the job description. So many organizations are still trying to manage people to a, to a job description. How do you understand? versus let's let's understand what it is that that employee walked in the door knowing understanding believing etc yes we need them to fulfill the, the the basic obligations and outcomes of the job that we were that we hired them for totally get it yeah but let's stop backfilling and let's start hiring for the skills the mentality the motivations the values the behaviors that we want going forward right and Let's deeply understand what it is that they bring to the table from a natural talent perspective, from a motivation perspective, from how they prefer to work. Right. And then here's the thing. I know this is revolutionary. Let's modify the job description over time to better align with what they want to do. Because what's happening instead is organizations are trying to revise the person. Right. And it is a lot easier to update a Word document that a job description is in than to try to update the DNA of a person who's trying to fulfill it. And again, the job description is useful because it becomes the seat of expectations, which then flows accountability, measurement, all the other things, performance management, you know, succession planning, blah, 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 blah. Get that. I hear, I hear you. On that. But let's pivot that. Let's just like we pivot our organizations to new growth opportunities. Why not we pivot job descriptions to fit the combined interest of the employee and what the organization needs at the same time and bring those two together. I, I think back to the... Uh, uh, the book years ago written by the extraordinary leader, and he was talking about the overlap of a person's passions, their skills, and the organizational needs, and where those three overlap, you've got a sweet spot. That's what we should be continuing to develop in people, and it might grow and evolve as they stick around longer. Sure. Now, of course, I get it. Project done. We have to close something down. We have to maybe say this is no longer a position that we need, and there's just no way we can put you somewhere else, right? But if we have the mindset to say, we're going to, our goal is to keep everybody here for the rest of their life. Then when they move on, what it does is it triggers a conversation to say, why? Why couldn't we keep them here? Well, because, and we have a good conversation about it, it becomes an after action review, a postmortem, you know, we yep. create an environment for an organization that is more about learning than execution, which ironically, the more you have in a learning organization, the more you execute, right? Right. All right. Well, and, and, and again, as BHAG as that is, yeah. look at where you started that thread of the conversation. You didn't start with, well, what if we modified a job description to do this? You started with the vision. Yeah. You said, exactly. what if we said, we want everyone to be here for the rest of their lives and right. fulfill their ultimate lifelong potential? Right. That's what you started with. You didn't start with, well, what if we threw out all job descriptions and started with, you know, a exactly. different job? And that, again, because by design, organizations have to be short term focused because that's how they're incentivized and that's how the executive team is structured. Yeah. Good, bad, or different. They don't know how to, they don't know how to step out and say a hundred years from now, what do we want this organization to be known for? Right. Right. 
What's the impact we want to leave on the world? And that's where I think family-owned businesses, which have their own set of challenges, oh yeah, kind of get it intuitively because they say, yeah. "What, what, what would our family be proud of behind our name if we were right. to build a brand?" Right. No, I totally get that. So, Claire, uh, this has been just a delightful, delicious, delectable conversation. Two, three Ds here: oh, alliteration oh, gone <laughs> amok. Uh, if I were just to sort of bring this home. And it might be that you're repeating some things, which is fine. I'm listening to this. I'm in an organization. I'm a leader of a team. And we're going through growth, either because of just expansion, new products, new requirements for top line revenue. Maybe we're going through some sort of a potential merger. But what three things should I take away? Because I can't remember 50, but I might remember three. What would you say those three things? I should remember as a result of your work and or this conversation. I think the, the absolute first do not pass go moment for any organization listening to this conversation is you, you need to get reacclimated to your why, your purpose, your vision and mission, uh, what I would call your aspiration. And if you if your reflex is to open up your browser and pull up your corporate website and go digging for your mission statement, you've missed the point. I think you absolutely, every single leader throughout the organization needs to reacquaint themselves with what is, what is your purpose, what's your aspirations. So that's step one. I think step two is to, is to also then reassociate yourself with who you feel your top talent is. And it's not all necessarily by rank or hierarchy. It is about, you know, if, if, if you put any leader to it, they can come up with a short list of who they consider their, their top talent, they're A players, the people who get it, not only because they're top performers and they just crush it year in and year out, but they do it in ways that don't leave a scorched earth behind them. And if, if you can at least do that, even if you don't have an ecosystem of learning, development, and talent, and all of these sorts of succession pipelines and, and, and all of that, that's a great place to start. If you jot it down on a post-it note, you're, you know, you're, you're A players, because you can then build around that and say, what does make them different? What makes them special? How do we keep them? How do we replicate them? And then I think the third, the third thing is, again, you know, some of the life skills that leaders, especially in organizations in particular, need to continue to demonstrate and embrace are resilience and adaptability. I think COVID taught us that. I think the organizations that survived and came out of it even stronger a couple of years later realized that they had to be resilient. They had to pivot. Yes, but they had to do it in ways where they could come out stronger. They could learn from their missteps and they could bring along people who could forgive them for delayed decisions or maybe the wrong choice from time to time because they believe in what they are trying to build over the long term. Excellent. I like what I want to call out one last thing that you said that the middle one around finding and really cultivating your A players. This was some uh, suggestion that I, I made to a client once is that those are the ambassadors in many ways of the culture and what good looks like. And so find ways to be able to, you know, even videotape little snippets about what makes what they do so successful. So we glean from them those stories and those anecdotes so that that becomes an onboarding repository of maybe little videos that new people can come in and go, okay, so what is what does good look like here? Oh, well, watch this, these three or four videos of the A players in our company, whether you call them that or not, probably is not necessary to call them that. But, you know, it's a way to kind of get, you can see these people, not the HR person, not the training and development guy, not the guy that you bring in from mission facilitators or your company who does that, somebody who's internal, who tells a story about what it looks like. Great stuff. So how can people follow you? And I know you got a book coming out. Mention that. Let's hear yes. about it. So LinkedIn is my social media of choice. Uh, you and I, if we are not already connected, we will we got we'll to be. try that in short order. All right. Um, my two websites are talentboost.net, which is my company site. My personal brand site is clairechandler.net. And I would love for your audience to go and get down the waiting list for the book that is coming out. And they can do that at growthonpurpose.com. Fantastic. Claire, great to meet you. Great conversation. And I wish you all the best success. Thank you. Same to you. I really enjoyed being here. Thank you for listening to The Business of Intuition. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts 
Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd like to learn more about Dean or Mission Facilitators Leadership, go to mfileadership.com. That's mfileadership.com.